Good morning, everyone. I am Christina Redditori, the Fine Arts Specialist for Racine Unified School District. Welcome to the first Orchestra Day. This is Orchestra Day 2021. Before we get started with our special guest, I have a couple of quick thank yous. We could not do today without the Racine Unified Tech integrators. And so a very special thank you to those who are behind the scenes right now making this possible. Um, and that is Julia FG and then also Randy Veen. So thank you so much. We have our community partners who also help us today and are helping us today. So special thank you to the RSO, to Con Selmer, and also to Dean Leslie Hines Walker and the entire faculty at UW Parkside. Um, a special thank you to them as well. So before I announce our special guest this morning, I would just like to say to all of the students musicians out there that today is all about having fun. It's all about learning something new. And most of all, we hope that you walk away today feeling inspired. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Scott Laird. Scott is joining us today from North Carolina. And his bio is very impressive. I, I apologize, I won't read the whole thing. Sorry, Scott. Um, but just a couple of, of quick things to point out to everyone who's here online. Um, Scott was awarded the 2019 UNC Board of Governors Excellence Teaching Award. Uh, he is also on the faculty of the North Carolina School of Science and Mathematics, where he is the Fine Arts Chair. And he's currently on the National Board of the American String Teachers Association. And we are so lucky to have him with us here today. So without further ado, welcome Scott Laird. Well, good morning, everybody. It is really wonderful to be with you today. It's an honor to be with you. Um, and uh, I look forward to getting to know you a little bit uh, in the next hour or so, and then a little bit later this morning as well. Um, uh, uh, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, a little bit about me, just so you just sort of know uh, what I am and what I do. I'm a, I'm a violinist. I grew up a violinist. I've been playing the violin since I was about six years old and um, what, went through a college as a music major. And I've been a, a string teacher and an orchestra director for 35 years. Um, so that'll give you a little feel for, for me as a teacher. I'm also a dad. I have three sons. My oldest is 23 years, 24 years old, and uh, he's a string teacher, believe it or not. He te teaches middle school strings in a, in a local uh, school system. I have a, a 20 year old sophomore at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and I have a senior in high school this year too. So those of you that are seniors, um, you know, I, I kind of get what you've gone through over the last year and over your entire high school career. I've been teaching seniors for 35 years, but having uh, a senior in high school in my house during the pandemic, I really know what your life has been like as well. So anyway, so that'll give you give you that little feel. And then finally, um, as was mentioned, I teach at the North Carolina School of Science and Math right now, which is a uh, STEM, STEM school. It's a school for um, juniors and seniors in high school. Um, and they live at our school. They come from all across the state of North Carolina. They live at our school for those two years. If they get into our school, they come on a full scholarship. So nobody pays to come to our school. It is a, uh, a fully supported by the state of North Carolina. And I get the pleasure of keeping orchestra and the arts in their lives for the two years there at our school, having uh, what is really a, a very intense STEM education. So that'll give you an idea of like uh, what my what my daily life is is like. Now I'm going to share my screen uh, right now, and um, the, for the next oh 45 minutes or so, we're going to talk about practice. And uh, uh, for for me, um, when I was asked to do this today, it was a, a nice challenge because I, I'm understanding that we have students that are uh, maybe as young as third grade that are participating today. And we have other students that are uh, in high school and seniors and juniors and sophomores, freshmen in high school, as well as middle school kids. So 
trying to put together a, um, a, an hour session of uh, something that absolutely everybody can use from the youngest of our students in the room to the oldest of the students in the room. And maybe even the teachers can, can use some of this later on as well. So our, our goal for the next 45 minutes or so is to talk about practice okay and we're um, and one of the things i'm aware of as a teacher is that sometimes students are told hey go pr practice i think i even did this as a dad when my kids were younger and i'd say hey go practice your violin go practice your bass and um, my kids would go to their their room or into my music studio and pick up their instrument and did they really know how to practice so today my goal is to give you tips on how you might organize your practice time I'm also guessing there might be some moms and dads online right now too. I sure hope you are. And if you're online, I would encourage you to maybe take a few notes, especially for the youngest of our students, and um, maybe incorporate what we talk about today into their practice routine when they're practicing. And uh, I think it will definitely um, pay off. Now, I'm hopeful that everybody got word ahead of time that I would like you to have your instrument handy and your music for your current lesson or maybe the music that you're working on in orchestra, maybe just a handful of music would be great to have both current and old and maybe something that you're going to start so that we can um, give you some ass short assignments during the course of the next hour. I am not going to talk for the next 45 minutes. Uh, I'm gonna give a little idea and then um, ask you to do a little practicing while we're going. So through the course of the morning, that's what we'll do. All right, so let's get into the uh, uh, context of our, of our talk here. So I like when I'm speaking with my students, young and old, I like to think of music and learning to play an instrument as basically the same thing as learning a language. Okay, and I grew up as a student of Suzuki. Maybe some of you have learned music from the Suzuki books, and I'll bet some of you have actually taken Suzuki violin or cello or viola lessons over the years. And um, I really, I really believe in um, one of the big concepts that Suzuki talked about was he called his method the mother tongue method. And what he really meant by that title is that we learn music very much the same way that we learn language. Okay, so when we use that big word fluency for the youngest of the students, we're really talking about understanding and speaking a language. We think about learning to play songs and notes and music that's been written by somebody else where we're speaking that language of music. We're using the words of that song or that idea. Um, Suzuki believed that we are best equipped to learn music when we're young, when we're learning to speak a language, age three, four, five, little kids. And in the Suzuki method, lots of little kids learn to play. The other thing about Suzuki's thoughts was he thought that we probably learned music best when we hear it first and learn to play it. And then we learn to read it later. And if you think about mu uh, language, don't we do that? I want everybody to think back and um, think about either yourself or perhaps a sibling or perhaps a, a child that you babysit if you're an older student. And um, what was the first word that you ever learned or that sibling ever learned? Let's just think about that for a second. For a lot of kids, the first word they learn is mom or perhaps milk. Or a lot of kids learn very early the word hot. Something's hot. That's hot. And what does, uh, what uh, 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 do you still use the first words that you ever learned? I'm guessing the answer is yes. I certainly still use the word mom. I still use the word dad, food, milk, hot. I use them every day. And I've probably, if you think about it, we've probably used those words more than any other words that we've ever used. It's the same with music. When we learn music, a song or an idea, the best way to really learn it is to do it over and over and over, and we never stop using it. So uh, eventually we take those words, hot, mom, stop, red, blue, and we start to put those words into sentences. 
I think often of the Dr. Seuss book, uh, one hat, two hat, red hat, blue hat, or something like that, I, uh, where we start to put together words into sentences. Or um, might have been fish, now that I'm thinking about it. I should have pulled that book out from when my kids were little. But I'll bet you, uh, many of you uh, read Dr. Seuss books and started to put those little words together into sentences. We do that with music as well. So the whole idea of today is that we're going to use a lot of uh, metaphors for learning language and bring them into our music practices. And I'm going to give you a five step method today for learning to practice, for practicing that relates very strongly to this um, music as language, music as fluency idea. Okay, and I think that every one of you, whether you're a very advanced uh, high school student or a beginning student in the third or fourth grade, I'll bet that you can um, use every one of these tips at some level. And I'll say one other thing, and that is that anytime I speak to a group of students or a group of teachers, I'm always aware that different people are at different places. And um, the goal is that if you pick up just one new idea in the next 45 minutes or so, I've probably done my job. And some of you will get much more than one new idea. So let's get right into it. Okay, so the way I start practicing every day is to play something that I know really well. When I pull my instrument out of the case and, and pick it up and get it tuned, I really think it's important to do something I know very well. It's very similar to using words that you know very well. Um, when we speak every day, we use words that we know. We don't really even have to think about it. For the youngest of children who are learning how to speak, they'll use that word. Hey, mom, this is hot. Can I have some milk? They'll, they'll use the words that they know very well. This is really, really, really important. I think that um, uh, a, a lot of students don't necessarily go back and play the music they've learned already. Sometimes we think of the music in your lesson book as, okay, I've learned the song on page 12 or the songs on page 12. Now I'm going to go to page 13 and I'll never revisit page 12 again. That's really not good practicing. Really, what I would recommend is that you play every song or many of the songs that you know really well every time you pick up your instrument. Not only does it remind you how good you are already, but it also reinforces the stuff that you've already learned. So here's what I want you to do. We're going to all take a minute and play something we know well in just a few moments. And here's what I'm going to ask you to think about while you're playing it. I want you to think about the experience of playing something you know well. I'm wondering if you can play it by memory, because when you can play something by memory without looking at it in the book, then you really, really do know it. And frankly, you can do it in a different way when you know it by memory. It becomes something different. And I might ask you to think about, well, what's different about playing by memory as opposed to playing uh, when you're reading the music. Think about that experience just a little bit, okay? And I wanna share one quick story and then we're gonna take five minutes to do this. My story is this. Uh, uh, when I was uh, a kid, uh, my friends and I would learn new words in, when I was in um, middle school and high school, we would learn new words in our um, English class and we would try to use those words as many times as we could during the day at school. And honestly, we would try to make each other laugh by using the words. And so we would just repeat them over and over and over. And those words eventually became part of my vocabulary by doing this, by frankly trying to crack my friends up with the words. And then we would keep using the words. So what I'm suggesting here is that by playing the stuff that you know well and keeping playing it throughout however many years or months or whatever it is, those songs become part of your musical vocabulary. And that's really what we want to do. Finally, as you're playing what you know really well, think about how you might be very expressive in the way you play it in a way that you can't with newer music. 
Okay, so it's 10, it's, excuse me, 9.15 right now. I'm an hour ahead of you because I'm on the East Coast. Um, uh, I want everybody to take five minutes and pick up your instrument, make sure it's in tune. And I want you to simply play something that you know very well, okay? And we will come back at 10.20. It's four minutes from now, okay? Play something you know very well. All right, now I know that wasn't very long, especially for the high school students that uh, have longer music for maybe for some of our younger students, you could play two or three or four of the pieces that you know very well. I wanna wrap up this first step by just kind of drawing this uh, one more a little example. Something I think about a lot is, you know, professional musicians, whether they're um, classical violinists or cellists or bassists or violists, or, or, you know, songwriters, singers, 
people who uh, play in bands, they play the same music, you know, every single day over and over and over. And I think we often wonder, well, how do they get so good at that? And to be honest, that repetition of playing the same music that they know already over and over and over is part of what makes them so good. I'm going to come back to that guy, Suzuki, that I mentioned before. And one of his very strong ideas was the more we play the music than, that we know, the more expressive we become as musicians. So this is really, really vital. I encourage every one of you to start your practice session by playing something that you know well. Not something that you're learning new, but something that you know well. Let's go to step two. If I can get my screen to advance, let's just see here. Whoop, there we go, step two. Okay, now step two for me is um, exercises. Now, some of you learn to play scales. Some of you have played etudes, and that, et that word etude is a big word. I'm wondering um, if folks know what the word etude means. Um, if you don't know, that word means study or exercise. So sometimes we'll have music in our books that is really designed for developing some kind of skill. Now, I like to think of scales and etudes very similar to learning to spell and learning our grammar. How do we build sentences? How do we spell words? This is the building blocks of music. Um, and so think about, you know, these little foundational ideas like spelling really, really matter when we're, when we're learning to play. Let me share this with you. One of the things about scales and etudes that I think people forget is that scales and etudes are not just about your left hand and playing the right notes. Once we learn the right notes and we can play those really well, then we can focus and think about all kinds of different things while we play a scale or an etude. Maybe we can think about playing with a straight bow. Maybe we can think about our right hand and having a nice fluid and relaxed right hand. Maybe we can think about, for our more advanced students, uh, vibrato. Or perhaps we can think about even phrasing with these things. So scales and etudes give us some kind of a vehicle to make the building blocks of musicianship stronger, okay? Uh, so playing scales is quite important. Now, my youngest students in the room might have a scale or an exercise or an etude in your book that you're working on. I want everybody to spend a few minutes working on an etude. And here's what I say to my students. When you play your scales, I want you to be a scientist. What do I mean by that? We're playing music, we're musicians here. But really in the end, if we think like a scientist, where we try to be curious about why are we doing this? Sometimes when you look at a scale that's written out or you look at an etude that's written out, maybe the notes are all the same rhythm. Um, maybe, it, it, maybe it doesn't look like it's that difficult even. But what I want you to think about is why am I playing this? Am I playing this to learn how to play maybe C sharp versus C natural? Am I learning this to maybe learn to play a B flat or an F natural? Or am I learning this to work on my bow technique or slurring? Or am I working on this for something else? So be a scientist, think about why I'm doing this work. And then the other, so be curious and the other thing that I like to do for my high school students, I'm sure when you do labs in science, maybe my middle school students as well, you've heard the phrase, limit your variables. And I think that's really important too. So very limit the things uh, that, you, that you change while you're doing it. And really think about one thing at a time, intonation, bow technique, how much bow you're using, um, perhaps vibrato, perhaps for some of the more uh, uh, advanced students, maybe uh, shifting and fluid shifting in your left hand, depends on what you choose. So I'm really hoping that everybody has an etude or a scale study handy. 
I'm sure all the more advanced students who are getting ready for perhaps some kind of an all state or all regional audition have to do uh, two and three octave scales. Maybe our younger students have something written in your book that's either a scale or a study. And I want you to be very thoughtful and be a scientist. Think a little bit about what you're doing. And we're going to take five minutes and work on scales and etudes, which are really the building blocks of music. Okay? Take five minutes. We'll come back at 10. Sorry, I keep saying 10 because it's on my clock. We'll come back at 9.30 and go to our next step. All right, again, I know that was really quick, uh, but we're gonna keep going. Obviously, as we're moving through this, for our younger students, 
um, there, I'm, I'm going to give five steps. If they dedicated uh, five or 10 minutes to each step in their own practice time, you know, there'd be about 30, 30 minutes or so of practice time, 20 to 30 minutes. For the older students, I know that, that you'll want to take more time on, on each of these steps or various parts of this. So let me just say that this is just the framework for all of you and you can adjust as, as needed. I do want to say uh, one thing to particularly the older students. You know, I say this to my students all the time that that when you're practicing, uh, let's say you're playing a Kreutzer etude and there are specific goals in the Kreutzer etude uh, as a violinist. And maybe initially you you uh, you're thinking about just getting the notes right. And then then um, what I like to say is you can look through different glasses at the etude to play it in different ways. For instance, you might play an etude first of all and practice that etude to learn the notes and the patterns of the left hand. Then the next day you might say, okay, I know those notes in the left hand. I'll wear a different pair of glasses. Now I'm gonna wear the glasses of bow placement. Should it be low in the bow, high in the bow, full bow? What am I doing with that bow? Different set of glasses. Then the next day you might put on a different set of glasses and do use the glasses of beauty of tone. Now I'm playing this and I'm really looking for a representative tone in this etude or scale. And the list of glasses, of pairs of glasses is endless. But I do think the best practicers are people that are able to sort of shift the glasses they're wearing on any, metaphorically, on any given etude. For our younger students, that might be a little more difficult to understand, but for the older students, I, I didn't want to miss that. Um, and the other thing is, uh, is you can always change things around. I, I noticed in the chat, the word about um, using Twinkle Twinkle as the etude. For those that are in Suzuki books, you know, each of the different right hand rhythms, um, I don't know what you call them. I called the first one Mississippi hot dog. That would be one rhythm. And then you can do Twinkle Twinkle with Alabama, Alabama, or whatever your pepperoni, pepperoni, whatever you might use, uh, and all of the various rhythms. And then you might even make up new rhythms for Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. And that can be your etude. And each of those rhythms for you is a different set of glasses. Okay. Okay. So that is number two. Let's go on to the third step in a good practice session, I think. Um, and that is working on new skills in your current lesson or learning new music. And I equate this in our language metaphor to learning words and listening. So let's think about how we learn new words. How does a child learn to say the word hot? Well, chances are good that they were stepping towards something that was hot and mom or dad said, hot, that's hot, don't touch it. And, and um, they learned the meaning of the word hot by listening to that word over and over and over. They learned the meaning of the word red by seeing red and now hearing the word red and incorporating that into their words that they learned to say. It's the same thing with music. Now, I, I'm getting the feeling that there may be some kids who learn through Suzuki. Now, I know that when I was a Suzuki student, we were supposed to listen to the Suzuki recordings over and over every day. Um, my wife happens to teach kinder music. Did any of you ever take kinder music lessons? I'll bet some of you did. She's actually teaching kinder music right now here in Durham, North Carolina. And part of the kinder music program is hearing the music over and over and over. Well, here's what I know. When I was a kid a long, long time ago, it sort of took a lot of work to listen to music. I had to go buy a record and then I'd have to get the record out of the sleeve and clean it off and put it on a, a record player. Maybe some of you don't even know what a record player is. And it just took a lot of work. In today's environment with uh, YouTube and Spotify and many, many other digital handheld options, you can listen to music very easily. And in fact, you can find music very easily. Our most, our youngest students, I'm sure can find recordings of all the music you're learning to play. And frankly, our most advanced students, a quick YouTube search or um, Spotify search, and you can probably find 
uh, 100 recordings of the Vivaldi Violin Concerto or the Mendelssohn Violin Concerto or Elgar Cello Concerto or a Bach Partita or a Bach Sonata. You can find those very, very quickly. What I've learned from my students over the years is they tend to think when they hear, hey, you got to listen to this piece, that they listen to it once and then move on. But let's go back to our language metaphor. You don't listen to a word once and then know it. You listen to the same words over and over and over. And that's how you get really good at using language is by hearing it and then imitating it. So listening is vital to uh, developing skills and knowing what you should sound like. I know for me as a teacher, from the very beginning when I started teaching, I really committed to playing for my students so they could hear it. And now in this remote and COVID environment, I'm not, I should have asked how, how much remote learning you all have done, but I know in my school, half of my students have been remote all year and I have to play things for them to hear it so they know what I'm sort of expecting when they play it back for me. Listening is vital. This is music as fluency. Um, here's one other thing about listening. I would probably have your music in front of you and have a pencil in your hand. Maybe take a few notes while you're listening. So here's your assignment. We have about four minutes in this segment. I want everybody to um, um, get a pencil, find the music that you're learning currently and look for a recording of that. I'm sure you can find it on YouTube or Spotify or maybe even a, a CD came with your book or something like that. And we're, this probably isn't enough time to really do it, but I want you to listen to a little bit of your current music that you're working on, whether it's an orchestra piece or a piece in a lesson book, or perhaps a solo. It's 9.37, we're going to come back at, let's say 9.41, just a, just a minute after uh, 9.40, 9.41, do some listening.
All right, if we can gather back together here, I'm going to try to be very time conscious here. I am a little uh, concerned because we just have about 10 more minutes. and I've got two more steps, so we're going to go kind of through them quickly. I want everyone to think about this. Uh, how many of you like to clean your room? Now, if you guys are anything like my 18 year old son, he would say, not only does he not like to clean his room, he avoids cleaning his room. When we ask him to clean his room, he seems to always find something else to do. And it's a mess right now, I can tell you that. Um, do you avoid cleaning your room? My guess is you do. This is a lot like practicing hard passages in your music. Hard passages are, most of us like to play the things we're really good at. And so playing and preparing a hard passage can be quite tricky and we tend to avoid it. But here's what I would say to you. Number one, with, at this point in your practice, I would go directly to the hardest part of your new songs that you're learning. What's the part that you struggle with? Go there first. Human nature is to go to the easiest stuff, play it because we sound good. But I would say, twist that around and go to the hardest stuff. But don't just play it, practice it slowly. And I have a little tip. Never practice a hard passage faster than you can play it perfectly, right? So if it's hard, you can't play it up to speed. You've got to slow down. Slow down so your brain has time to think about the new ideas that you're working on. Never practice faster than perfect. This is like using our words correctly in our daily speech, using words accurately. This is part of the, the plan. Sometimes we have to slow down and think about how we're putting words together, how we're using them so that later you can use those words very um, quickly and efficiently and fluently. That word fluency that I used early, earlier is it's all about being accurate and really understanding what you're doing. So slow practice is key. And by the way, if there's one thing that I tell you today, this is the one you want to keep. Everybody, best students, high school, all state level players, all the way to beginning twinklers, practicing slowly is vital to success. And here's something I want you to think about. The most efficient way to be able to play a hard passage fast is to practice it slow. Again, the most efficient way to learn to play something fast is to practice it slow. Now, I'll bet there's somebody out there thinking, you know what, Mr. Laird, I can't play certain stuff slow. I have to play it fast. And I'm going to tell you, that's a falsity. You're telling yourself that and it cannot be true. If you can't play it slowly, you can't play it appropriately well fast. You have to go slow before you can go fast. It's just part of what we do. It's part of practice. Okay, so break your piece into smaller sections. Go to a section that you find hard. Maybe it's a string crossing. Maybe it's a, a fingering. Maybe it's a bowing. Maybe it's a rhythm and slow down and practice it. Now we're gonna go kind of quickly here. Let's take two minutes and just practice something that you think is difficult in your current piece. Practice it slowly. We'll come back at 946.
All right, I'm back. Now, I know that was a really quick couple of moments for slow practice. My guess is that some of you might have struggled a little bit just to be able to play music slowly. Um, it's a skill. And so I want to really encourage everybody to work on that skill. It is vital to be able to practice slowly. I want to tell you a quick story. I talked to a conductor of a major symphony a couple of years ago, and he told me that something he noticed about the best professional soloists in the world is that when he hears them practicing in their dressing room before a major concert performance, they are never practicing the piece they're playing up to speed. They are always practicing it slowly before they go on stage to perform it up to tempo. The best in the world. He told me he heard Yo-Yo Ma doing that. The greatest, probably the greatest classical musician of our day practices slowly right before going on to perform. If it's good enough for him, it's good enough for all of us. This, the last step, and, and I'm not going to take the time to do this, but the last step in a good practice session is applying everything that we've done to your music reading skills. We're applying all of the scale work, all of the, the music that we know already, all of the slow practice to being able to read music. Um, and just like learning to read words, read sentences, and read paragraphs, and even books, this is how we learn to mu read music. So at the end of every practice session, I would probably practice my music reading skills. Now, if you're a Suzuki student, you're taking the song that you've learned, maybe you just learned the two grenadiers, and you've learned that all by ear, and now you put the book in front of you so you can see what those notes look like. That's learning your music reading skills. Maybe for some of you that have learned in other uh, traditional settings, you're, um, take a piece of music that you've never seen before and just practice reading it. This is really, really vital, and I think it's an important aspect of any um, uh, practice session. I want to share this with you, and then we're going to wrap things up. I believe that we learn to play music by first hearing it. I call that ear. Then the second step is to take what we hear and apply it to the physical skills. I call that ear to hand, okay? We hear it, now we play it. Then the third step is ear to hand to eye. We see it, read the notes, play it, and hear it, okay? So if you can take that kind of idea, first ear, then ear to hand, then eye to ear to hand, that's a great way to learn new music and to develop your skills. Okay, and music reading is just like reading out loud. Okay, I'm gonna review. Here's the practice routine. Everybody can do it. It's what I do when I pick up my instrument. First, I play something I know well. I'll take 10 minutes or 15 in my practice session to do that. Play one or two pieces I know very well. I then work on my scales and etudes, the building blocks of music. It's like practicing your spelling. Then I work on the new skills in my current lesson, um, uh, and I do that through listening. Then some slow practice on the hardest stuff, and then I finish up with my music reading skills. For our youngest students, that might be five minutes times five, so about a 25-minute practice session, just about right. For our more advanced students, this might be, you know, you might spend a shorter time on playing something you know well and then dive right into your scales. This could be an hour long practice session or longer for our more advanced students who are playing harder, longer music. But this gives you some kind of a framework to go back to time and time again and really be um, using your time efficiently and well so that uh, you're not wasting time. Because that's something that does happen sometimes with students when they're not sure what to practice. So there you have it. I hit my 950 goal here, and I'll bet some of you are ready for a little break at this point. Um, thank you for your kind attention to this. I hope that everybody is able to take something away from this, maybe just a new way of thinking about music, maybe this metaphor of learning language and learning music. And I'm going to give you one last thing. For our um, high school and middle school students who are um, uh, interested in thinking about things in an interdisciplinary way, I will share with you that imaging 
um, a research like MRI research shows us that when we play music, the area of the brain that is excited that the most blood flow goes to during music performance is the same area that is used for language. This idea that Suzuki had back in the 60s and in the 70s really was his idea, but it has been really proven through imaging and science. So it really is a metaphor that is built on um, really some, some pretty good science and it, and it just makes a lot of sense. I hope that this is something that you can apply in your practice every single day. And uh, this has just been a blast. I hope you've enjoyed this. I hope you've learned something. I'll be back with you at about uh, 1030 or yeah, about 1030 uh, to tell you a little bit about my life as a musician and as an electric violinist. Thanks everybody. And we'll see you in a few minutes.